Okay, we're going to look at critical reading here. Now, we're going to be deliberate with this program. Some of the other programs we're going to work on moving through quickly, work on your reading speed. But this one we want you to be proactive with. Maybe pause it and see if you can come up with the answer yourself. Or you can pause it and review what's been said. You can even go backwards and see what's been said previously. Take control of this so that you learn and work on your critical reading abilities. This is where you can work to make those SAT passages be a source of points rather than misery. As always, we believe it helps to read the questions over ahead of time. Now, you've been told that when you have a split passage, and this is a passage one and passage two situation, that you want to read the first third of the questions over, then read passage number one and answer those questions, then read the balance of the questions and read passage number two and answer the balance of the questions. Now, we're not going to do this in this example because it's a little bit hard to do without being able to have the reading right down in front of you on pages where you can skip back and forth. So in this case we're just going to go through continuously. Number one, which one of these statements would most noticeably enhance passage one's assertion about the role of television in the civil rights movement? Okay, we're going to want to know about how passage one talks about television in the civil rights movement. Number two, considering the excerpt within lines 21 through 29, what role does still photographs play? Okay, we got a line reference there. Have one in three as well. Mechanism in line 33 indicates. And passage one's incorporation of a quotation in lines 31 to 34 could be considered a flaw in the passage in what way? We want to know why that quotation was used and what negative effect it had on the passage. Number five, we want to know how passage two it asserts that television newscasts present their material. We want to know in number six what codes means in line 38. In number seven we want to know how the passage number two argues about dif disinformation. Then we want to know the organization of the final paragraph of passage two. Number nine we want to know how both passages deal with something. Then we want in number ten to know what both authors assume about television viewers. And in number 11, we want to know how they, the two passages differ from each other. So now we have an idea that these passages are going to be talking about newscasts, television, television viewers, and we have an idea that there are going to be some differences and some things the passages have in common. Okay, so let's read the passage. With instantaneous illustrations and texts shot through television waves, modern viewers are able to shape their own beliefs on political events and leaders. Often, television coverage has actually engendered nonconformist action against traditional policy. The 1960s, by no coincidence, saw the television convey to American culture not only the facts and events of the civil rights movement, but also the guttural rage and perseverance. With the events of Selma and Montgomery plain for the American people to see, the civil rights movement became a widespread consideration instead of a collection of self-contained incidents. By nationalizing these local events, the television effectively presented the wide range of unrest and disenfranchisement to the American viewer. The television newscast's capacity to encourage political nonconformity has been additionally affected by the proliferation of personal video cameras. News then can start just as much with the individual as it can with the television executive. Spanning the globe, Video cameras assemble illustrative evidence of atrocities and violations of human rights. Closed borders cannot block this endless flow of images. Jack Nalis, a professor of pop culture, perceives the camera to be an honest machine that can rip through lies. That contention relies on the idea that the viewer can trust the images on screen. The photographer's complex and perhaps bias motives must be considered. Even plain images on a television can be phony. Television is, of course, potentially just as phony as still photographs. If governments start to manipulate computerized effects, viewers would have even less faith in the images channeled through the television. But still, seeing images in itself is often the quickest path to liberty. Teddy Coppella, a newscaster, comments, George Orwell was wrong. The television, which Orwell hypothesized would be the totalitarian mechanism of propaganda, has instead become its arch enemy. Now we have passage two. To indicate a transition from one topic to an unrelated new one, television newscasts use the words, now this. The two words indicate, if subtly, that the world according to the television codes and orders has no meaning and should therefore be disregarded. 
even the most devastating hurricane or the most significant political slip-up cannot be transmitted through television without those two words preceding it. Now this. With pretty and packaged newscasters, APT commercial virtue, and interruptions by corporate sponsors, television news is indistinguishable from any other product. With hype, superficiality, and no serious consequence to anyone's everyday life, news and entertainment are one and the same. Disinformation is what the television waves transport into American homes. Not necessarily false, disinformation is deceptively out of context, chopped up and frivolous. An illusion of knowledge emerged from the flashing screen. But genuine understanding of the world eludes the television viewer. In America, newscasters do not intentionally mislead, but when they and their stories alike are arranged in tidy product packages, honesty and accuracy are nudged aside for a profit. It's not that viewers have no authentic information, but that their sense of a complete body of knowledge has deteriorated. Television news has so utterly invaded the American consciousness that the new flashing world of temporally isolated events has overridden a world of coherent cumulative history. Why would we want to juxtapose what the President said then and what he says now? To do so would be to reuse past news, and that would hardly attract viewers. Even George Orwell could not foretell these now givens of television news. Lies and truth have not yet become indistinguishable. But what has happened is that Americans have been lulled into indifference about incoherent fluff. Aldous Huxley did foretell the situation. The government has no advantage in being covert and concealed when its constituents are completely desensitized to hypocrisy and contradiction. In case you're wondering, if you're able to keep up pretty readily with the way I read that, you're reading at about 170 words a minute. Plenty fast enough. This is an interesting question to start with, because it's asking you what enhances the assertion in the passage. Now look here, we're looking very specifically for the assertion about the role of television and the civil rights movement. We've got some pretty specific phrases to work with here. Okay, television conveyed to the American culture the events plain for America to see. And the passage here says that the civil rights movement became a widespread consideration and that the television effectively presented the wide range. Okay, these are positive statements about the role television played. Remember, we want to learn to read to critically get rid of answer choices. Okay, we're looking for something positive about it. So, TV executives refusing, that won't work. It certainly wasn't talking about how scholars were questioning how objective the broadcasts were. And the first civil rights leader's biography, that's totally off topic. And in E, it talks about reporting techniques. That's not what it was talking about. It's off topic. But D, remember we're looking for something that enhances their assertion. And if a poll was taken in the 60s and it showed that only television viewers thought the civil rights movement was important, wouldn't that absolutely strengthen the assertion that television played a positive role? Here we've got a line reference question where we want to see what role the phrase still photographs plays in the passage. Remember, when you have line references, you're not looking at just the line they're referring to. And we're not looking at just the phrase still photographs here. We want to get a feeling for what's being said around it. In this case, the passage is saying that the photographer's complex 
and perhaps biased motives must be considered. It goes further to say even plain images can be phony, potentially just as phony as still photographs. The clear implication here is that you can't take things just at face value. They must be examined and we have to look at the still photographs carefully and not just blindly accept them as being absolute truth. And here again we benefit by eliminating answer choices. We can eliminate A because it's not talking about how precisely current events can be recorded. Indeed it's going the other way. C is clearly off topic in talking about how the computer has revolutionized methods of representation. D won't work because it's not talking about contesting computer effects misleading the viewer and it's not talking about reinforcing the great influence videotaped images have. Rather it's used to expand on an argument about the honesty and integrity of the television. This is an argument. This isn't saying a right or wrong exists but it's questioning it. This one is another line reference question wanting to know the role mechanism plays, what it indicates. looking here for the impact of mechanism or what it means and remember that you don't usually find the meaning specifically in the line you find the word you find it around it and in this case in the first line we have that seeing images in itself is often the quickest path to liberty and that totalitarian mechanism of propaganda had instead become its arch enemy what they're saying there is the television would be the mechanism of propaganda. That would be the means, the way of distributing the propaganda. Remember when you're looking for the meaning of a word or what it indicates, first thing you can do is eliminate common definitions. Definitions that someone would come up with if they hadn't even read the passage. In this case mechanism, I, I'm probably going to rule out gear in an electronic device even without reading the passage and if I look down there I can see that it's not an entity. I guess we can't really rule out a small part but B is definitely the meaning because it's an agent for totalitarianism. It means it's acting for a means of communicating the message of totalitarianism. So it's its agent. Here we get back to a little bit of the logic of arguments because we're talking about incorporating this specific quotation in lines 31 to 34 and how would it be a flaw in the passage? What does it do that deters the passage's message? Okay, the quotation says that Orwell was wrong. The television was not a means of helping propaganda for totalitarians, but it become its arch enemy because seeing images is the quickest path to liberty. So how does this create a problem? Well, it really doesn't, except why would they say Teddy Coppola, a newscaster, comments? That's crucial. Remember, sometimes it comes down to just one word. So we have a newscaster commenting on television. And in logical argumentation you want to be objective. So we have a problem here. The flaw that this creates is E, it's a television insider defending his own industry. And if we look back at the others we can still see that A is, doesn't work because it is relevant to the passage the quality of media is actually destructive. We're making a judgment there. 
Fiction is being cited as actual research? No. And the particular contention remains unchallenged? No. Clearly, the flaw created by this quotation, the only flaw created by this quotation, is the fact that it's given by an insider. The television guy is doing the quoting. Now, this is a difficult question. This isn't easy reasoning, so don't think that just because you didn't see that newscaster having an impact means that you haven't got a chance on this. This is what you're practicing. This is what you're learning. Now, this question jumps to passage two and wants to know the assertion passage number two is making about the way newscasts present their material. Well, passage number two is not too impressed with newscasting. It's talking about its superficiality and no serious consequence to anyone's life. And it clearly then states, news and entertainment are one and the same. So the assertion in this passage is clearly that news has become trivial, relatively meaningless to us. And having that clear statement and using our critical reading, I mean, we can underline, actually underline the statement, makes this question really fairly easy because we see that B, our answer shows that news is pre presented to entertain the viewer. Now, we always have to consider the other answer choices because, remember, we're looking for the best one. So let's rule out the political figures are held responsible for their policy values. That's off target completely. Fiction is presented as fact. No, that's not what it's saying. Complicated subject matter becomes easier to understand. In fact, they're doing the opposite. And political mistakes are completely fabricated. See, these are all off topic. Here again, we're looking for the meaning of a word or what it signifies. This is going to require some careful reading. Here we're looking about how they say that television newscasts use the words, now this. The two words indicate that the world, according to television, codes and orders, has no meaning. Okay, how is it doing that? Well, and how are we using the word codes here? It says it should be disregarded. Even the most devastating hurricane or most significant political slip-up cannot be transmitted through television without those two words preceding. Okay, now this introduces and says dismissively, we're going to move on. The passage specifically says the television codes and orders means the world has no meaning. And we've got our work cut out on this. This is a hard question because of the answer choices. The codes here, they're probably, we can rule out that they're the television codes and orders. We can rule out patterns. We can rule out charts. Those are a little off topic. Might be secrets, to, but it's not television secrets because this is known. This author is saying that we know about this. So it could be techniques or it could be rules. Now, Let's think about this. That would give us the phrase rules and orders, which is almost redundant. I can also eliminate rules because codes, if I hadn't read the passage, could be a definition for rules. So we're talking about techniques here, which is further reinforced because we're talking about the way television does things, the way they transmit the news, the way they include now this. Again, the line reference for a word and how the word is interpreted, and that's 
the use of disinformation, how does it impact viewers? Not us as readers, but the viewers. Fortunately, we have a pretty clear use of disinformation. It says, not necessarily false. Disinformation is deceptively out of context, choppy and frivolous. It's an illusion of knowledge. And it, what it does to viewers, it's not that viewers have no authentic information, but their sense of a complete body of knowledge has deteriorated. Again, we're looking at how disinformation impacts viewers. Okay, A, by encouraging them to act upon information that is actually false. No, it said it wasn't false. It was just distorting it. By making them suspicious of what they see on television. No, it's the opposite. It's making them comfortable in what they see. Certainly not D, by increasing their susceptibility to advertising. That's off target and pointing them away from certain political figures. Now, it may be pointing them away from news, but it wasn't as specific as political figures. So, we're left with C. It helps them perceive something as credible when it's really not. And here we want to know how the final paragraph of Passage 2 is organized. Now, we found it helpful when you're looking at the organization of the passage, glance at your answer choices. This is the one time to do that. Glance at your answer choices before you look at that last paragraph because it will help you move towards interpreting that passage. We don't need to necessarily dwell on the answer choices, but we just want to glance over them. A, one claim is rejected and another one takes its place. B, an argument is presented and is buttressed by historical fact. C, two opposing arguments are presented then actually reconciled. One argument is presented then the opposing argument is explained. A circumstance is explained and a hypothesis of future events is presented. When we read the passage, it says even George Orwell could not foretell these now givens of television news. Lies and truth have not yet become indistinguishable. But what has happened is that the Americans have been lulled into indifference about incoherent fluff. It's pretty clear what's happening here. We're discounting or disproving or stating that lies and truth have not become indistinguishable, but what has happened is that something else has happened. So we're disregarding or discounting one thing and saying something else has happened. Let's keep those two phrases in mind. Some things have not become something, but what has happened is... Okay, we're rejecting one thing, aren't we? And then a new one takes its place. Clearly, that's what's happening in this passage. That's how the passage is organized. Okay, we can discount the others just to make sure again. We're not talking about a historical fact that supports an argument. They certainly aren't reconciling or bringing these two arguments together. The opposing argument is explained, but one argument is presented. No, it's not presented, it's rejected. And a hypothesis of future events. We're not talking about anything in the future. So clearly A is our answer. Here we want to see where the two passages deal with something in the same way. Both deal with manners in which. Okay. What we want to do is look at something here which is really something anyone would agree with. Neither of them say that news intentionally fabricates its subjects. That truth poses complicated challenges to the media that want to restrain it. Now, again, that's too strong. The typical American viewer can discern what is information and what is embellishment. Indeed, the second passage says we can't, and the government's been attempting to socialize broadcasting is way off topic. Clearly, and this is what anyone would agree with, B is our answer, that television can influence viewers in the delivery of its news, and most specifically in the way the news is delivered. And here again we want to know where both authors agree, both authors assume what about television viewers. 
And remember, we're talking about both authors here. A, we can rule out because neither author really talks about reading the news. B, uh, they watch other television programs other than news. Of course they do, but neither author is addressing that. That they are not able to completely understand coherent news. Well, it's implied perhaps by that second author, but not by the first. That they only know about the most important current events. No, because that's, in fact, the second passage says they don't know about major events. However, both show in their passages that they do believe that people believe everything they see on television. They don't give people much critical sense. So E is our answer for what both authors assume about television viewers. And remember, we're basing this just on what they've written here. Now in this case, we want to know where they differ. And if I look at them pretty clearly, I'm going to focus a little bit more on Passage 2 because I think Passage 2 had a pretty distinct message. Passage 2 argues the primary objective is to support established governments. No. Cautions that viewers may obtain false information through the news. Not false information. Passage 2 and C says that newscasts belittle the importance of news. And that's the point the author of Passage 2 was making, that news is trivialized through television. And if we look at D, news provides only a superficial understanding of the issues, that works too. And down in E, Passage 2 says that commercial advertising influences the subject matter. No, it didn't address that. So now we're torn between C and D, based on what Passage 2 said. And Passage 1 in D warns that viewers may form rash opinions based on the news. No was talking more about, as it says in C, that groups could mi misrepresent news, that it could be manipulated. So C is our best answer.